So the science is clear, we are facing a climate and ecological crisis. Over 40% of UK species are declining and our soils and landscapes have been degraded by previous agricultural policies that incentivised intensive food production. In 2019, the UK government committed to reaching net zero by 2050 under the Climate Change Act. This target is necessary to reduce the emissions which are causing climate change. With agriculture as the fourth largest contrib contributor to UK emissions, it is no surprise that it has come under the spotlight when it comes to climate change mitigation. Due to previous management of the land, the resulting degradation of our natural environment has left landscapes less able to sequester and store carbon and ecosystems less resilient to global warming. With increasing attention on the role of farmers in addressing climate change, there's a growing demand for farmers to demonstrate how they are reducing farm emissions while increasing carbon storage on their land. But amidst the breadth of conflicting advice and often confusing data collection, getting started on the process of monitoring farm emissions can be daunting. What is clear, however, is the need for farmers to urgently begin integrating climate mitigation and, adapt and, and adaptation into their businesses. This session brings together members of the Nature Friendly Farming Network to discuss how farmers can deliver ambitious actions for climate change, bringing numerous benefits to both their businesses and nature. This session will demonstrate how farms can begin to understand their carbon footprint, take action while avoiding trade-offs for biodiversity and profitability, use climate adaptation to become more resilient to the impacts of, warming, of a warming climate, and then we'll finish with a discussion which will provide an opportunity to hear firsthand from farmers who have already integrated climate change into their businesses and to hear the wealth of benefits from doing so. So I'd now like to introduce you to our first speaker, which is Phil Carson. Phil is the U NFN UK policy lead, supporting farmer members to have their voices heard in key policy decisions. Prior to joining the NFN, Phil was a senior policy officer at RSPB, and before this, he worked as an environmental advisor to farms in County Down, Northern Ireland. Phil also co-hosts the podcast, Wheat from the Chat. So I'll hand over to you now, Phil, for your presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Lodi. I will have a go at sharing my screen and start my presentation. Can you see that okay? Yep, we can see that. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction, Lottie. I'm Phil. I'm the policy lead for the NFFN. And I'm just going to very quickly go through a presentation um, on a piece of work that we delivered a couple of years ago, which was supporting farmers to I suppose, baseline their own um, carbon footprints, but also marrying that up with um, biodiversity assessments on their farm as well to try and identify areas where you can deliver um, benefits for nature and climate together, but also to identify potential risks in, um, in terms of trade-offs in both those areas as well. So I'm going to go through that and I'm going to um, yeah give a bit of an overview, I suppose, of the, the benefits and the risks of trying to undertake carbon auditing. So Lottie's already covered this um, in, yeah, in, in really good detail, but I'm just going to go through the context in terms of, of what we're operating in. And we have I suppose, imperatives to address climate change on a range of different levels. So we've obviously got the, the Climate Act, which is setting um, a legal imperative to deliver net zero by 2050. But we also have um, a moral obligation to, to address global warming, not just for ourselves in present day, but other people around the world who are more affected and also for future generations as well. The other thing we also have to look at is the economic harm of not addressing climate change and the costs of inaction are, are grave and we really, really need to get a handle on this. But within that too, we also need to look at biodiversity and nature loss um, and the potential risks that um, will, will result if we don't get a handle on that in terms of food production, in terms of profitability, in terms of our resilience to climate change because both of these are, are really linked. There's a lot of focus on mitigation, but we also need to look at adaptation as well. And quite often we focus on addressing climate change, but we know that a level of global warming is already baked in and we need to develop, um, I suppose, ways of coping with that. And that comes down to, to everything, but especially in terms of how we farm and manage our land. And we've got projections in terms of certain areas of the country really struggling to, to kind of continue on in terms of business as usual based on current global warming scenarios. 
as Lottie mentioned, agriculture has a really crucial role to play in addressing some of these problems and doing so in ways which um, yeah, try and capitalise on co-benefits and avoid trade-offs. And in terms of our ability to produce food in the future and to, to, to continue with profitable businesses, we, we really need to get a handle on both of these issues. Um, the picture is on the right. So this is just, I thought was quite interesting. It's um, a Met Office piece of work, which looks at what the weather forecast could be in 2050. And as you can see, yeah, there's there's pretty severe consequences in terms of um, yeah how we, how we adapt to that. And then as we know this winter, we've had a really significant flooding as well, which um, is, is a direct result of climate change, but also points to the need to adapt to it as well. So with that and that focus on agriculture, there has been growing attention to how individual farms can reduce their own emissions and can assess where they are. And one of the key things within this space has been the development of a range of different carbon calculators that all try and provide a baseline of your GHG emissions at the farm level. Some even go to looking at sequestration as well. And these are a really important and useful tool in terms of, yeah, I suppose, putting your foot into the, the kind of climate sphere and really trying to understand what you can do and what's in what's in your control as well. Obviously, we have emerging markets for for um, for carbon, which um, yeah are, are going to be requiring um, up to date data collection and, and forecasts in terms of reduction, carbon sequestration and storage as well. So that data collection and building robust ways of doing that is going to be really important, too. But one of the things I really wanted to to kind of hone on, hone in on in this is that we have um, an imperative to address climate change, but we've also got the imperative to address nature loss and to do so in ways which um, don't conflict with each other. And in this space, farming is really, really key. And we have a number of on-farm nature-based solutions that can help farms both mitigate against the, the climate crisis, but also adapt to it as well. And I think this, this image on the right-hand side kind of demonstrates how we can manage landscapes in ways that make them more resilient and, and, and help deliver both of those, those objectives. Um, but we can also look at things in a very isolated way. And if we focus too much on one rather than the other, or focus on certain strategies which don't take into account the potential trade-offs within that space, then we we can incur, I suppose, disbenefits or negatives as a result of that. So it's that need to look at the whole picture within that too. So that kind of points to the project that, that we delivered and yeah, the aims within that. So this was a project that worked with a number of farmers across Northern Ireland um, to try and understand what their, their baseline carbon footprint was, but also the value of the business in terms of its, its biodiversity provision too. And we wanted to assess, I suppose, the strengths and weaknesses of undertaking carbon auditing and some of the, the, I suppose, the potential risks, but also the opportunities in terms of rolling that out on a wider basis. And also to look at, at some of those, um, yeah, I suppose, recommendations to try and address some of those trade-offs as well. So we worked with 35 different farms from across Northern Ireland, and these were representative of a range of different sectors. So we had um, lowland beef and sheep. We also had upland systems. We also had dairy systems. And then we had some arable systems and mixed ones within that as well. The carbon calculator that we used was AgriCalc, and that was based um, on the fact that it is widely used in a Scottish context, and we were advised that it would be the most applicable and most suitable to use in, in our study. Within that, we also undertook basic soil testing um, to understand, I suppose, the nutrient levels of soils, but also to get an understanding of soil organic carbon. Um, and then on top of that, we delivered phase one habitat survey. So that was um, a walkover survey undertaken by a trained ecologist to try to identify priority habitats on the farm, um, which would provide nature value. There was no species surveys within that as well. Um, following that, we put together quite a basic, I suppose, overview report, which demonstrated or, or outlined the, the carbon footprint. Um, and then also the results of the phase one habitat survey with some basic recommendations in terms of what could be delivered to improve the biodiversity value of the land. We also delivered um, a follow up meeting with all the farmers involved in the project with advisors from AgriCalc as well to give an overview of what their carbon footprint data would show them. And then also alongside that potential strategies to um, lower emissions on that front as well. 
So I'm just going to go through some of the, I suppose, the interesting things that we found within the study itself, and then some of the, the overarching kind of results within that too. And the first one that I think really struck out to us was, um, yeah, decisions that are used within the carbon calculators can paint very, very different pictures depending what you're what you're measuring. And one of the key points within that was this relationship or difference between carbon, um, yeah, I suppose carbon output per hectare, so the tons of the kilograms of carbon um, or carbon equivalent per hectare on the farm versus the number or the level of um, carbon output per kilogram of um, output. So say for example, per kilogram of beef, you would have um, a, a, an equivalent outage in terms of emissions within that as well. And what we find within this is that this tool very much focused on the data on the right-hand side. So it was the primary focus, which, I suppose, um, looked very much at maximizing efficiencies in terms of production. And what we found was that farms that were generally um, more intensive in nature, and probably it would be fair to say had less nature value in many cases, did quite well in this score. So I suppose the more efficient they were in terms of production, um, the better that they did. This didn't look at total carbon or total um. I suppose greenhouse gas output of the whole farm, so the total carbon footprint. It was just a metric of a metric of efficiency. The one on the left hand side, so it tended to put um, more extensive systems in a more favourable light. So those systems that were generally associated with um, grazing and upland environments, for example, and they did better in this one, but tended to do very poorly on the other. And in some cases, these farms had a very very low carbon footprint. At, on its total, but would perform very, very badly in terms of the level of output. So it just really pointed to us in terms of the the choices that are made within um within the carbon accounting. And I think we can touch on this a little bit more later. Some of the other bits and pieces that were were interesting from our perspective were the levels of, I suppose, nature value or average nature value on the farm. And this was, I suppose, not a conventional way of trying to um, demonstrate this, but habitats were generally classified into high value, and that was generally um, semi-natural habitats such as acid grassland, um, yeah, marshy grassland, peatland, things like that. There was medium value, which does, was generally um, put forward as semi-improved grassland, dense scrub, things like that as well. And then low value was generally associated with, um, yeah, I suppose improved improved pasture that was, um, yeah, I suppose reseeded and was receded, receiving nutrients and things like that as well, I suppose artificial nutrients. And then we also looked at the kind of average level of habitat provision on a on a farm scale. And you can see the block up between, between those. What I would say was this was an average and there was quite a variation between different different farm types and then also geographically as well. So I suppose the western part of, of Northern Ireland um, tended to do better in terms of that level of biodiversity provision too, but it just pointed out some, some interesting trends within that as well. So this one here is just a bit of an overview of soil organic carbon. Um, and you can see again, there's quite a large variance in terms of those levels. So you're looking at some very, very peaty soils and then some um, some soils which have, I suppose, yeah, pretty, pretty low levels of um, organic carbon within them as well. And this was really interesting because a lot of the farm businesses that we were working with had never actually received soil testing like this before. And it provided quite a useful insight as well. Um, also just the variance in terms of pH levels. So you're seeing some, some very, very acidic soils, not so much in the, I suppose, on the, um, yeah, the kind of calcareous side of things, so the alkaline soils, um, which which you generally expect where, where we are on the Western side of things as well, and with a lot of rainfall. And then, so um, I'm just going, that gives a bit of an overview of the results. And now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the experience itself um, for any anyone, yeah, thinking of undertaking similar projects or who've been involved in them anyway. Um, so from our perspective, 
this was a really really useful project but it was quite a time and intensive intensive project in terms of data collection and also in terms of delivering surveys and things like that so it might be something that proves challenging in terms of rolling out on a on a large scale um i suppose one of the key takeaway messages from us is an audit really provides a snapshot but it's generally based on averages and algorithms it doesn't provide the very detailed overview of what your carbon footprint actually is. And we've heard stories of different carbon calculators all being used on the same farm and coming out with, with very, very different results. But that principle of, I suppose, looking and providing a baseline and using that to measure progress and inform action is, is crucially important. And how you do that and, and what you do next is, is more important, I suppose, than the baseline baselining itself. Um, as I mentioned before, we saw a really big variation between different regions, but also different systems too, which I think points to the need to, to not have a one-size-fits-all approach to, to trying, ad trying to address um, climate change through changes in, uh, in land use and changes in agriculture as well. In terms of habitats assessments, so they were they were time consuming as well, but they provided really useful information to the farmer. And from our perspective, were really really key in identifying some of the risks and trade offs, um, which could result from a very very narrow focus on greenhouse gases. And one of the things that I just wanted to, to point out in that respect is, yeah, the potential risk to nature if you focus on a very yeah what would we say kind of carbon tunnel vision. Point of view and that idea that um, the holy grail is just to maximize efficiency and and really drive down the level of emissions per per unit of output for some systems that is going to be be really appropriate and it's going to work really well but for others it's not going to be the case and this is an example of a farm that's um operating within an upland environment so it's a it's a beef and sheep system um it's got a range of different habitats on it so it's got um yeah kind of acid and neutral grasslands it's got a range of semi-improved grasslands but it's also got a lot of priority habitats within that too Large parts of the farm are actually designated as a as a protected site. So um, yeah, the equivalent of a triple SI in this in this space and are managed through an agri-environment scheme. But what we found was whenever this went through the calculator, it performed very poorly in a in a in a, in a carbon context. And then whenever we went through, I suppose, the soil testing and things like that from it too. The recommendations from nutrient management and I suppose from from the audit would really be pushing for um, yeah improvement and maximizing efficiency in that space, which doesn't necessarily impact the priority habitats here because they're all mapped and some of them are designated. But from our perspective, could undermine the opportunity to actually move towards, I suppose, more extensive grass and management and potentially making some of those semi-improved areas um, species rich over time. So there's a missed opportunity in the best case. In the worst case, if those protected habitats aren't properly mapped, then there's a real risk to their integrity too. The other thing within this is like grazing is really, really important in, in this landscape and, and for these systems. And the risk is that a focus on a very narrow focus just on greenhouse gas emissions will disadvantage these systems and you may see a focus more on massive land use change as opposed to continuation of of that kind of sensitive grazing for these habitats as well so it's it's just drawing attention to to the risk of being um very focused on one thing and not the whole so to sum up our perspective on this would be that um yeah if you're focusing just on one thing you're probably going to incur significant um, negative impacts on other priorities that you, you have to deliver as well. Carbon auditing is a really, really useful tool, but it has its limitations. So some of those that I mentioned before, but there was others that we find in too, but it's it's a really, really useful and can be useful baselining tool, but it needs to be linked up in our opinion with other things as well. So that includes nature value, but also other values as well within that. And um, one of the key things within this is just adaptation and not just focusing on mitigation but how can you create a landscape that is resilient to change and, and and is adaptable to future circumstances and then finally one of our main findings was just that need for support and advice so 
for many, carbon auditing is something that is new. It is something that is potentially um, difficult to navigate, and there are a lot of trade offs within that. If it's if if it's if your actions aren't aren't well informed, and um, yeah, there's risks within that too. So advice and expertise in that space is is really key as well. So that's a bit of an overview of the project and really keen to hear about some of the farms that have been um, implementing some of the things that we've been talking about in, in action. So thank you. Thanks very much for that, Phil. That was a really excellent kind of overview of some of the pitfalls of um, potentially using um, carbon auditing systems on their own out of context of, of kind of the wider um, situation on farms. So um, we're now going to move on to our second speaker of the night, which is our first farmer, David Lord, who will share his, his experiences um, with kind of mitigating and adaptating adapting to climate change on his farm. So David farms 750 hectares of combinable crops in a family partnership on diverse soil types on the north, on the Essex coast. His farming system revolves around soil conservation and regeneration using cover cropping, diverse rotations, minimal tillage and direct drilling to reduce inputs, lower costs and improved biodiversity on the land. Half the farm area is owned, the rest um, tenanted or contract farmed. The farming business has diversified to wind farm, fishing lakes, holiday lodges and building lets. David's supports independent science and farmer-led decision-making, co-founded Tendering Farm Cluster is an Essex and a few combinable crop chef and on our England steering group. So I will now share um, David's presentation for him. So let me just check. I think it's this one. Hopefully you can um, see that now, David. Thanks, Ozzy. Yeah, that's actually the last slide. <laughs> Oh, is it? Right. OK, uh, yeah. let me go back. I don't know why it's gone straight to that one. There we, go. Many. there we go. <laughs> right. Thanks, Lottie. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to Phil for that overview of, of carbon auditing. Um, Lottie's just done a very good introduction. So um, most of this first slide is done. But um, we have actually done a carbon audit um, on our farm here. Um, and unsurprisingly, as an arable farm, it pointed to fertiliser as being uh, the largest of our uh, of, of the cause of our emissions um, since we did that audit, which was about eight years ago, we've managed to reduce fertilizer use by about thirty percent. Um, so I'm sure if I did one now, um, it would it would show us as as being better off. But uh, they are um, they are time consuming. They're worth doing um, to give you an overview. But um, as Phil said, it's it's really uh, an indication of what you need to do. Um, on the farm to reduce emissions and, and what practical steps you can take. So, as Lottie said, we're um, uh, we're we're an arable farm here on the Essex coast. Um, our rainfall per year is six hundred and five mil. Um, so we're one of the driest areas in England, um, which has its challenges. Uh, we do grow um, some potatoes uh, and some onions on some of our lighter land, which uses irrigation. Um, so uh, that in itself, I suppose, is, is one way of mitigating climate change, storing the water. Um, Lottie, if you could do the next slide, please. So um, with carbon auditing being one thing, I, I, I think how we respond to climate change on our own farms is probably uh, a more pressing matter individually. Um, and this rather complicated table on the right is, I, I just put together all of our rainfall figures since um, 1987 um, and just highlighted the, the wetter the wetter months um, and the drier months. So the wetter ones are the darker colours and the drier are the lighter colours. Um, and what I actually found was that winters for us are getting wetter uh, and the growing months of the year, so April to um, June is getting drier um, so that for us is a challenge because we we generally water is our limiting resource um, when it comes to the, the summer months um, and how we uh, deal with that really is um, is what I'm going to talk about in a minute um, the temperature extremes um, we're actually quite lucky here on the coast because uh, when we've been having these really high extremes of temperature, um, certainly last year, we were seeing a sort of five or six degree um, difference between ourselves here and even just 10, 12 miles inland. So 
being near the coast was was, was beneficial then. Um, uh, in terms of sea level rise, we do actually farm right down to the sea level, uh, to the sea. We've actually got land below sea level. Um, sea level rise is an interesting one. I, I was trying to find some figures on on how it's changed. And at the moment, the, the only figures I could really find was that it isn't really changing, which I was surprised at. But um, it is rising ever so slightly, but not, not to a great degree yet. But with uh, in terms of our sea defences, um, what we are seeing is an increased frequency of storms, um, and that's where the threat comes to our um, to our land. Is uh, if we get a, a storm surge um, and, a, and high winds, um, when all the things align with the moon being in the right place and the wind being from the right direction, we can see a storm surge which can drive water um, it, uh, up the creeks and and, and top over the the sea defences. Um, luckily that hasn't happened to us yet but I've had um, friends further up the coast who have been topped um, and, and that risk is there um, there really isn't much we can do about that we're reliant on the environment agency to maintain the, the seawall um, uh, so yeah that's that slide next one please Lottie so the Solution, as I see it, for, uh, for mitigating climate change for, for farms, really, it, it, it centres around carbon, unsurprisingly, um, getting carbon back into our soils. And a great little stat I came across uh, last year is that one hour of sunlight produces 1.4 kilowatt hours uh, of energy per metre, which is 14,000 kilowatt hours a hectare, um, which is a huge amount of energy. And if we can harbour that energy, um, that's a free issue good sunlight. If we can harbour that and um, use plants uh, to use that energy and convert that into carbon and sink it into our soils, then that um, that can only be a good thing. Um, if the if we're doing that, we're feeding our soil microbiome. Um, that in itself is freeing up nutrients that would otherwise be unavailable. Um, and at the same time, we're improving our our soil structure. Um, maintaining our straw, soil structure as well, um, and residue plays a huge part in our in our system here. Um, we try and leave as much residue on on the surface as we can. Um, it in a, in hot periods it cools the soil. It's amazing sometimes if you on a really hot day you go and put your hand on a bare bit of soil and it's really hot, but underneath a bit of residue. It's amazingly cool, and things are still running around and doing stuff underneath that residue, despite the heat. And it's also conserving moisture, um, which for us is important in the summer months when we're trying to sow our cover crops. Um, it can quite often be very dry, uh, so that little bit of moisture that protects can help get help get them going. Conversely, when it's really wet, um, as it has been for us, as it has been for everyone this autumn. Uh, when we get heavy rain, it um, it reduces rain splash, so we don't get the uh, the the surface runoff, the the muddy waters, um, which can um, drain some of the best bits of the the soil, uh, and um, it reduces the the impact of um, of, of runoff, uh, and then the residue itself slowly gets incorporated by by worms. It's amazing, actually, within about six eight months, um, they've pulled most of it most of it in. Um, in terms of cover crop mixtures, we're using um, a, a pretty diverse mixtures with radish, mustard, buckwheat, vetch, um, phacelia, clover. What else we use? Sorghum, all sorts of things, really. Um, a bit of a cereal element with, with volunteers that are there. And we fit them in between our, our growing crops as, 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 as often as we can. Basically, our, our shortest cover crop would be eight weeks between harvest and an autumn sown crop um, our longest one can be six months um, and in terms of cropping uh, we also try and have a really diverse crop rotation um, just to reduce risk really because if you get a, a wet autumn like we've just had that's going to put um, make it challenging for your winter crops uh, and then we we live in hope that we're going to have a kind spring um, which means you know the, the spring crops might help us out a bit more than than they normally do. Um, and then the other uh, 
start of this, which which Phil touched on, and um, our later speakers are going to talk more about, is is the impact of livestock um, on soil, and it's something that we we are um, it's a work in progress for us to get livestock onto our land. Um, we were dairy farmers until the late nineties, so it's not beyond uh, beyond our skill set, but uh, um, it's something that we have tried with sheep, um, and uh, we use some straw for muck situations, but um, uh, getting the cattle back in the land, whether it be grazing the cover crops or actually with a, a two or three year lay um, would be really useful. And I think that would really supercharge getting carbon back into the soil. Um, and as I say, carbon is, you know, it's 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 the hub around which we're trying to farm because it's uh, it's providing that resilience to the to our system, um, which will help mitigate the, the effects of of climate change. Uh, next slide, Lottie, please. Um, but un underpinning the success of, of this operation is is drainage and water management. And um, I think Debbie's going to talk a, a bit about this as well. But fr from our point of view, we're, we're fairly flat um, where we are in, in Essex. And we've got mostly heavy soils so we use a, mold, a mold drain system which for those that don't know it's a uh, you put a drain with stones on top um about uh 28 inches in the soil with about six seven inches of stone on top and you pull a machine which is that one in the middle there um a mold drainer through that at 90 degrees and it makes a channel in the clay um for the water to run along and then it trickles down into that into that drain and it's a really efficient way of, of draining um, draining our our heavy land. Um, that's the image on the right, which is the the uh, permeable backfill. Uh, and then on the left, you've got the the system um, where you where the water table comes up, and then you're draining that way to stop that uh, from affecting the affecting the crop. Um, drainage is is something that is absolutely essential for making our systems work, making our farming resilient. Um, it's often been overlooked and it's something that we are trying to go around. Um, we've got drainage systems on our farm which date back to the 1940s, 1950s, um, and they are breaking down. So we are going around and investing in drainage to try and improve um, uh, try and improve our, our resilience on our farm. Um, and the combination of drainage and uh, um, the cover crops and all the other things that we're doing, the, the soils are healthier, uh, so they they hold more water. You know, they're, they're, there's more air in them. A healthy soil has a lot of air in it, and so we get when we get these heavy rainfall events, uh, they're like a sponge. They can absorb the water um, and hold it and uh, and reduce the uh, the flooding um, flooding events downstream. Um, and if we if we don't have these systems play, if, if they're left to degrade, what happens is the soil profile fills up the water. And as soon as you get heavy rain, it's already saturated and it runs straight off. Uh, so there's, um, you know, it, it's it's quite a, quite an important thing that's not talked about as much, I feel. Um, that, I think, is all for me. I think there is one more slide. Um, is there a lot of, yeah, no, it's just, yeah. So... Yeah, look forward to some questions. I hope that sparked a bit of bit of interest. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a, a a good subject, and I think that the only thing I'd say in parting is that uh, I've, I've found that talking about carbon, um, quite often carbon is a proxy for biodiversity for nature. The things we do for carbon are also good for nature, so it's a two way thing. Thanks, Lottie. Thanks, David. That was really interesting. Um, always really good to hear kind of different farm perspectives and especially from an arable farmer and, and kind of especially the area that you are which is um very affected by drought um and also um the recent wet weather as well it's, it's really interesting um to hear what you're up to on your farm so we'll now move on to our second farmer of the night and that's debbie wilkins um debbie wilkins has had um a very varied career um where she has worked for a corporate food giant Unilever as a research scientist specialising in proteins and ice creams and spreads and um, before moving back and helping to run her family farm, which is in Gloucestershire. Um, and she has a passion for regenerative farming. Um, and I'll let 
Debbie, and like David, um, where I introduce this whole farm, I'll let Debbie explain a bit more about her farm. Sorry, I was having problems with it. Can everyone hear me? It, it wasn't the... Didn't like me yes, trying to screen share. Yeah, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm just going to try to screen share. Okay, so hopefully... So hello, thank you for the introduction, Lottie. And I, I think I'm going to cover some of the things that David's already said, but a lot of them are pretty important. So I'm quite happy to, to go back through them again. Um, so um, a little bit about me. Um, as Lottie said, I farm in Gloucestershire. We farm about 950 acres. It's a mixed dairy, beef and arable farm. Um, and we're in the Seven Vale between Gloucester and Tewkesbury. We milk about 180 cows, calving all year round. We keep all the calves um, for beef or replacement, taking the beef through to finishing. Um, we have a lot of permanent pasture, most of which is in the floodplain. Um, last month at the height of the um, floods, we had about a third of the farm underwater. Um, and on the top left picture is some of our fields. Um, yeah, about three weeks ago. Um, we um, try to graze as much as possible using rotational and mob grazing and a focus on soil health and nature friendly farming. Um, I'm a pilot farm for Arla Regen Dairy um, and I'm trying to do things to improve the farm as much as possible, but it's very much a journey and we're not there yet. Um, so as I said, um, I am to farm in a regenerative way, but it's very important that I'm producing food and also making a profit. Um, you can't do the former without the latter. Um, the focus is on soil health. Um, and I think we're trying to, re yeah, we are, I think we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions and sequestering carbon. But um, for me, that's a byproduct of how I farm rather than what I'm trying to do when I'm farming. <laughs> Um, so we very much try to use the five principles of regenerative farming to improve the soil health. Um, and for me, these will improve the soil organic matter. I see soil organic matter as a dynamic thing rather than just a um, thing that you store in the soil. Um, and it improves the soil function and improves the ecosystem surfaces, such as your water infiltration and your drought resilience, as well as... Um, improving plant growth with reduced inputs. So I see it as a positive circle. If we get it right, we reduce the inputs, improve the soil, allow more organic matter, which means less inputs needed for the plants to grow well. They put more organic matter into the soil and so we can reduce the inputs further and hopefully it's the win-win um, situation. So things I try to do is reduce the disturbance on the soil. So whether that's um, using less fertilizer, um, trying to, I'm trying to use foliar feeds rather than bagged fertilizer, um, making use of the manure I produce on farm and composting that, um, or whether it's reducing sprays, particularly eliminating fungicides and insecticides, or whether it's reducing wormers to help the worms in the soil and also the um, dung beetles, and also reducing tillage. So um, if you get carbon in there, you don't want to burn it off by too much tillage, although I've got heavy clay soils and I haven't been able to reduce tillage completely because otherwise I can't get seed in the ground. Um, the other thing I've tried to do is diversity. So whether it's diversity in rotation, um, multi-species cover crops like David was talking about, or um, herbal lays with mixtures, or even my um, species rich meadows, which have a huge mixture of different things growing in them. Um, Again, livestock is very much part of the farm, being a mixed farm. Um, we graze cover crops, um, put manure and compost onto fields. So the livestock very much integrated into everything. 
and living roots. I've tried to have something growing in the fields at all time. I see the plants as these solar solar panels collecting sun's energy and they're converting a lot of that sugar into exudates that they're putting down into the soil and increasing the organic matter down there um, and keeping the soil covered. So whether that's um, using um, crop residue like David was talking about, but I see in kind of the livestock sense is not grazing everything down to the max, leaving um, longer covers and um, even if I'm grazing cover crops, only taking the kind of 50% of it and leaving um, something there to protect the soil. So um, I have been doing carbon footprinting um, with Arla for about the last five years now. It's part of my milk contract and I have to do it, but they only look at greenhouse gas emissions um, and not sequestration. And I feel this is kind of skews it um, a bit. It has to be um, a simple system to fit all the different types of farms, but um, it does drive um, towards more intensive systems, especially as it's kind of done on a liter of milk. So higher yielding herds will have a lower carbon footprint. Um, and I think this misses the um, the biodiversity and ecosystem services that less in intensive systems bring. Um, I had a ARLA audit um, on Monday this week, um, and the inspector challenged me about um, the age of first calving of some of my heifers, um, suggesting that I should reduce it and that I would reduce my carbon footprint. Um, he suggested that I didn't graze the heifers pre bulling and kept them housed to increase the growth rate. Um, and I do. Um, I have been weighing some of these animals and I do a rotational grazing and I found that I get a point, about 0 0.9 kilos daily live weight gain over the last couple of summers um, and I know I can probably get a higher growth rate if I house them but um, that was going to be a higher cost um, and I feel that they're going to be animals that I want to graze and I want to um, yeah, I want them to start off grazing and not be a housed system. And so it's very much, um, yeah, the system can push you in a direction that might not fit everything you want to do on farm. And I think um, there is a lot of things depending on what system you use. And I went to talk recently about um, GDP and GDP star, different depending on how you account for methane, which has a big effect for ruminants. Um, because the main greenhouse gas from my carbon footprinting is methane from the ruminants. So um, the less cows I've got, the better my greenhouse gas um, um, levels are. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say was about um, grants. Um, and so things like FFI, I, I tend to look to see what I'm doing on farm. Um, and then see what grants fit for that rather than the grants pushing me to do something. For example, I've not used insecticide for quite a few years now, so it's quite easy to have the SFI option of no insecticide. I have some herbal lays um, and I'd like to put in more. So the SFI on herbal lays is definitely the way I want to kind of go. And so, yeah, this slide is just to remind me to talk a little bit about kind of the nature on the farm and how that I feel is quite important. So I feel like the trees we have on farm and the hedges, they are a great way of sequestering carbon, um, but also um, improving the environment, the cattle, whether that's shade or browsing, um, improving the soil. Um, I'm told about the mycorrhizal networks extending quite a few meters from the hedge and improving the, um, the soil and the plants around the hedges. Um, and things like, um, I have quite a lot of species rich meadows um, and they're very diverse. And the, you know, when I've had soil tests, I've had up to 22% carbon um, organic matter in some of those fields. Um, but also they're, for me, they're very resilient with my flooding. I can't really stop the River Severn coming over and filling my fields with water. 
but these meadows have done that for many years um, and they're resilient and they come back. Um, so they have, you know, for me, they have great nature. They also produce food. And hopefully with um, the new countryside steward options with payments for them, um, I'll get paid for them as well. So that'd be a win-win. Um, and just generally um, having nature on the farm brings me joy and is great for mental health. And for me, it shouldn't all be about figures. Um, I think that's all from me. Thanks very much, Debbie. That was really inspiring. It's it's lovely to hear about you kind of fighting back against the power of uh, carving um, age and things as well. So it's it's just it's really interesting to hear kind of how you see the benefits of nature as well, kind of as a positive just for mental health as well as kind of sorting out your carbon and everything as well. So we're moving on to our final speaker of the night. Um, so we're, it's Sam from Galborough Farms in Cumbria. He farms with his wife, Claire, on her family farm near Oldswater in the Lake District. And as before with Debbie, I will let Sam introduce himself and his farm. Hi there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I'll just share my screen. Is that working all right? Yeah, that's looking good. Cool. Yeah, so um, this is where we uh, where we're lucky enough to live and farm. Uh, it's my wife's family farm, um, and, and we've been here for uh, seven years now. Um, so her grandfather bought it in nineteen seventies. Um, he farmed there till the late nineties, and then after he died, it went over to being um, grass let um when we first started we were kind of emulating what claire's granddad did really and we had a, a flock of swale dells uh, we were breeding <clears throat> mule gimmer lambs and we were using lots of fertilizer i have to say we were spreading fertilizer about three times a year um and we were cutting a lot of grass to make um, silage um using quite a lot of like insecticides, uh, wormers, um, porons to stop the sheep getting um, fly strike. Um, and none of this was really um, working out for us, actually, to be honest. Economically, we were really struggling, but we were also conscious of um, climate change. We we're conscious of this kind of poly crisis of not only carbon problems, but, you know, biodiversity crisis, uh, soil degradation. Um, and yeah, we were, we just wanted to to feel like we were um, doing something to help rather than kind of contribute to to the problems. <clears throat> we were also we felt quite keenly the sort of need to to perhaps restore and um, to help biodiversity, particularly on a kind of marginal farm. Um, and we look back at the history of the farm. This map goes back to 1695 and it shows our farm in a more of a kind of, um, it, it, well, it shows that it was a wood pasture, essentially. Uh, and we've even got kind of evidence of, of you know, from 1695 to, you know, three, three 400 years later, um, a lot of the trees were cut down or kind of overgrazed, um, perhaps. Um, and so we felt like partly what we needed to do was to restore this but at the same time we wanted to make sure we were producing food because we're you know acutely aware that we need to feed ourselves and we need to yeah we need to make sure we're eating really healthy food at the same time um and then a really important part of our kind of context is um where we've got a young family and um, so we've got two children um and yeah we wanted to make sure that our farming was fitting in with with our children um, and to make sure we had time for them time for each other right to cut across you um really sorry just the slides aren't on presenter mode so i don't think they're advancing as you're going through oh right oh dear um how do i do that um let me see if you go up to the slideshow on the top bar uh, yeah yeah and then do from current slide from current does that work? 
that should do. Um, should show the family. I think it might just be a wee bit slow. Yeah, currently we're on a, a, a slide with some soil on it. Um, okay. I mean, I can talk about that because that's uh, it, it wasn't the one that I was on, but as part of um, our kind of investigations, we did some soil soil sort of pits, digging holes, looking at the soil structure. Um, and a lot of our lower fields in particular were, were very compacted um, with kind of short, yellowing, unhealthy plants. Um, in some of our woodland areas and areas that had, hadn't been cut or grazed, you know, the, the soil was just completely different, although like the underlying conditions were the same. And so we wanted to we wanted to move our farm and, and our soils towards, you know, to be much more healthy uh, than they were. Um, I don't know if this is, is that moved on now? It hasn't. Do you want, if you stop sharing, perhaps I could try and share your, because I've got your presentation as well. Shall I try yeah. sharing it? Would that okay. be yeah, helpful? Fine. Yeah, so I'll, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, let me try and share now. Um, now I'm trying to find your presentation. Um, sorry, everyone. Where were we up to, Sam? Um, if you go, yeah, that one. This one. Well, yeah, so I was talking about the soil and I was talking about how sort of unhealthy um, it was looking and you know, we think this this is because of all the fertilizer and the cutting and compaction that we were causing. Um, and if you go to the next one, it'll sort of explain what we do now. So yeah, this is what we <clears throat> so after we sort of radically um radically changed what we're doing, um, we decided to actually sell all the sheep um and instead focus on on cattle. And allowing the grasses to grow long and to keep the cows outside and essentially what we do now is we we use adaptive multi-paddock grazing so with electric fencing to to keep our cattle in one group and try to move them um every day um from kind of eight mid-april through to december and this means that we get lovely long rest periods uh, and, and the root you know root depth of our grasses is getting better and better and it also means that the that the sort of upper part of the farm is uh, rested uh, and gets a chance to kind of fully recover. So when we come round into December, we put the <clears throat> the whole herd goes up into into the wood pasture, uh, and they stay up there until kind of February March, um, when we start bringing them down and um, getting ready to start sort of mob grazing again, as it were. And another really uh, important thing is in that wood pasture, it means we get uh, we get lots of natural regeneration of trees. So we're getting lots of alders um, popping up, um, particularly in the in the watercourses. Um, so which is really important because not only is it pulling down carbon, um, but it's also helping to stabilize the watercourses and reduce uh, kind of runoff um, because obviously we're you know we're right next to the lake. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Lottie. So yeah, this is a typical kind of summer um, summer sort of move. So we try to leave the grass quite long, quite a long residual. Um, and we go try to, yeah, just keep everything in one group and focus on contentment, making sure they've got access to shade and shelter. And uh, we use a mobile water trough to make sure they, um, they've always got that. Um, and we try a, a key thing to reduce carbon emissions was that we decided to try not to make much hay. And instead of cutting about 100 acres, we cut uh, an, on average every year about 15 acres of hay. Um, and uh, that is, you know, having a massive impact. Not only is it saving fossil fuel in the summertime, but it's saving fossil fuels in the winter because we're not having to feed it. And um, so it just it, it works really well. And um, so if you go to the next one, Lottie. And we started just seeing really exciting kind of um, improvements in biodiversity. So we've got things like the um, pearl-bordered fritillary butterfly, top left, 
um, which we saw on a thistle plant. Um, dung beetles, just generally, we've seen last year, <coughs> really started to see an improvement in dung beetles. It's taken about three or four years for them to actually come back from all of the insecticide and, and ivermectin and sort of other wormers we've been using. Um, and we've seen things like these mites that, that are carried on the on the legs of the dung beetles that actually those mites will eat the the larvae of the face flies that cause um, cattle health issues. And it's, so it's really good that we've seen these these mites coming back. It just shows the ecosystem is starting to recover. And then another thing is it's just loads of spiders. We've seen tons and tons of tons of spiders coming back, um, which you know they're like the, the sort of predator of the insect kingdom. They catch flies and they help us to basically not need you know we're not finding that we need to use any um, fly treatments anymore, which is really important. But if you go to the next one. And then this is some of the so the trees that we're seeing um, up in the wood pasture. So this was uh, last summer. So this is the you know these are two or three year old saplings that we haven't planted, and they're just popping up now, um, which is really great. And um, we've also um, put this area into stewardship, so we're we're doing some um, tree planting um, alongside it to try and get some like willows and oak trees as well uh, back into this area could you go to next one yeah and so this is cattle up in the in the park in the winter um so we find they're very very content up here um and yeah it just giving them access to just lots of grass and the shelter that they get from the trees um works really well if you go to the next I'm going to probably keep saying next slide. So that, yeah, that sort of works really well until about March um, when we find the nutrients in the grasses die back. And so we start feeding hay um, in March and we've started doing something called bale grazing where we rest a particular field and um, place the bales out in September while the ground is still dry and then unroll um, two bales a day. It's going to be this winter. For the herd and then um yeah just focus on moving them so it doesn't get too poached up um and yeah you go to the next slide these are the trees that we're planting and um, so that is probably that's going to be about five oak trees in the middle surrounded by thorns to, to protect it from browsing we didn't want to use any plastic so we, we went down this this style planted i think um i'm a bit conscious of time so maybe we should yeah that's it yeah um just keep going through we, we're plug planting um wildflowers instead of going down herbal lays route we, we decided to do a species rich grassland restoration because we feel like it's more resilient and the plants that we get in the species rich meadows are more suited to our to our environment we think and um, if you go for the next one and then we've had some really good um, progress with our soil. So this this um, slide shows a, a segment of soil that we looked at in 2019. And then the same place two years later at the same time of year. Um, and the infiltration rate has improved greatly. You can see just from the, from the photograph that it's getting more aggregated. Um, and in the same time, we've managed to in increase the, the species from about three or four species per square meter to about eight species per square meter on average in our meadows. And that is without that's before we did any plug planting. So it's it's definitely going in the right direction towards more diverse sward with uh, deeper rooting um, vegetation. So if you go to the next one. Yeah. So this is slide I thought I'd put up because I think it's really important to remember that digging up fossil fuels that have been buried millions of years ago is not the same as having a cow um, outside eating grass. The carbon cycle for a cow is is obviously quite complex. There's a lot going on in that in that slide. Um, but essentially, you know, it's just belching out methane that it's ingested from from what it's eating. So if it's eating grass and it's outside, um, then it's really not adding a lot to to uh, to the atmosphere. Um, and I think that is quite often 
are perhaps not considered in some of these carbon calculators and some of the tools that are being used. Um, and then for, if you go to the next one, Lottie, the I wanted to put up this, which is a farm called White Oak Pastures um, in the US. So they are managing their cattle in a similar way to us, adaptive multi-paddock grazing. They've been doing quite a lot of life cycle studies on the carbon emissions and they're proving that they you know they're sequestering lots and lots um into the ground and actually they've <clears throat> they've kind of compared it to all of the alternatives including kind of plant-based foods and i just think it's really really quite interesting um this type of work and i did if we go to the next one i actually haven't done this up until just a few days ago so i decided to use farm carbon toolkit to do a very quick baseline on what we were doing in 2018. So this is going through and quickly, I was, I was very impressed actually by how how quick it is to use, um, to just get a quick sort of snapshot of what your, of what your farm um, is doing. If you can, you know, you know your your liters of fuel that you're, that you're using every year um, and you've put in your fertilizer. So we were using 20 tons of fertilizer a year. And that meant that we were, we were emitting quite a lot but then you put in your offsets. So we've got woodland on the farm and actually that seems to offset, you know, a lot, uh, a lot of the emissions, which I think is kind of like a slightly dangerous thing um, in that, you know, it could just lead people to think, right, we'll just plant trees everywhere. Um, but I'm not sure that's the right approach at all. Um, but this shows that in, in 2018, we had a carbon balance of approximately eight tons per year. And I would say with a bit of a health warning on this, that I did it quite quickly. And I don't think that it's the most robust um, thing that I've ever done in my life. Um, but I just wanted to give a quick example of what, what could be done. And if you go to the next one, I did a similar thing um, for what we did uh, last year. So our obviously our fertilizer has gone to zero. We don't spread any anymore. Fossil fuels has come down um, drastically. Um, and our offsetting has gone has gone up because we are now in countryside stewardship and we're you know we planted 10,000 trees we're converting an area to wood pasture where we've got all of that all the natural region that you could see and this so this is telling us that actually now we're sequestering 200 tons a year which is which is pretty cool and again i would say i'm not going to i'm not about to go and put this on all my packaging and say look at us look at us look at our beef isn't it you know, it's all carbon negative because I don't think it's that robust this calculation, but it definitely gives you an idea of what of what's possible. Um, so yeah, if you go to the, I think this is the last slide now. So I just want to finish up with saying that um, yeah, we're pasture for life certified, so we sell all of our beef direct off the farm, and we're in organic conversion now. Um, we also sell things like our leather products to try and sort of maximise the income um and yeah but i would say i guess don't just focus on carbon i think it's far more than just that we need to look at the biodiversity we need to look at family life you've got to look at the social side of, of what you're doing um but it's interesting the approach we take we took yeah, it seems to have definitely helped with carbon and um, along with kind of profitability and everything really so yeah thank you Thanks very much, Sam. That was really, really interesting. And it's um, although you say you haven't done an official kind of carbon audit, it's nice to see um, the kind of impact that you're having without actually <laughs> doing that. So we'll move on to the kind of Q&A section now and we'll get to the audience questions in a minute. I've just got a few um, questions from the chair, which are possibly a bit more broad ranging. So um, now that you're all um, kind of or you maybe haven't done carbon audits but you've kind of thought about climate change and adaptations and things what would be your kind of key pieces of advice for someone who is quite new to the carbon auditing or nature-based kind of climate mitigations and adaptations so what would be your your advice and maybe if we go to you first um david and then we'll kind of move around the screen so um oh thanks for that lottie uh <laughs> i would actually say um Farmer to farmer knowledge exchange actually is the most important thing. So I, I'm involved with 
a few local groups um, of sort of like-minded farmers, but then there's also NFFN as a, a national thing. Um, there's also Base UK who are really good. Um, and actually that uh, the knowledge is out there. There'll be a farmer somewhere who's tried what you're thinking about doing. Um, and everyone's happy to, th th in this sort of environment, everyone's happy to share their experiences and, and gain from that. So jo join something <laughs> and uh, yeah, speak and, and share your experiences because that it, it's, you know, that I found it really rewarding. Sam, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm similar. I'm going to plug Pasture for Life, I think, because um, I just think, um, you know, that it's a really great organisation and along with Nature Friendly Farming Network, of course, uh, uh, and, um, that you know, they organise lots of visits and things to different farms and talks. Um, but I'd say, you know, it's 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 kind of obvious where to start, I think. The, the fertiliser has such a huge um, impact that anything you can do to reduce that um, it's, it's got to be you know the, the place to start really um, and then and that then fossil fuels obviously now that's great and and debbie um what would be your kind of key piece of advice i'd say you can do little things you don't have to do everything you know look for like the easy wins of what you can do and everything if it's one small change everything if it's going in the right direction is is a good thing so you don't have to doesn't everything have to be changed whether it's just you just plant cover crops or you just look at grazing slightly differently or um yeah so there's lots of lots of little things you can do and you don't have to do everything straight away bill do you have anything that you would add to that from your experiences on the northern ireland project um just from the auditing process don't take it as rote always like it's a good indicator but it's not the gospel and i think some of the examples that people have shown here is that there are um if you if you took everything completely literally and followed every single um example within it it might take your system in a completely different direction than what you'd want it to yeah very very good points um second question from me would be um and i think debbie you touched on it a bit that um, the kind of new schemes that come out and kind of the financial um points from that but how do each of you see the new elm scheme helping you adapt your business to climate change and do you see it helping you adapt at all david um yeah yeah i mean it's it's come a really important time for us arable farmers because um we're seeing commodity prices dropping off a cliff um so supporting the changes that we're doing um it you know that it, it's it's good it's a positive move um i think some people are finding that a challenge because uh you know they've, they've we've been having quite good commodity prices in the last 18 months so and i, th I think suddenly a, a lot of people are now um sort of staring off the top of the cliff if you like and um but it, it, i think if you embrace a lot of these small things these incremental gains like debbie was saying just the little things um they can make quite a big difference uh and and the options which are out there now i, I think it's it's a really positive environment for change at the moment that's great sam what about you um, yeah, I mean, I think they, you know, they have increased payment rates on quite a lot of, um, you know, good uh, options for people. Um, but I think it's tricky, you know, I think it's tricky to get into some of the schemes is the, is the first thing I would say. Having, we've, we've just managed to get into one and it was quite, you know, it's, got, it's a lot of work and not everyone is going to qualify for some of these, some of the habitats. Um, so, yeah it's going to help but i think ultimately it's down to each kind of business to just sort of make an assessment of where they're at and then try to try to make changes debbie yeah i, I think i re reiterate what i said in the talk that you know looking for what you're already doing and getting paid for what you're already doing is definitely the way i i go for things but also, yeah, just looking for those 
unproductive areas that can you know can be put in into different schemes whether you know the corners of fields or you know where you can put wildflowers or different things you can just lots of little bits again add up so it may only be that you get 50 pound for putting whatever in that small corner but if you've got lots of them then um, it all adds up so yeah so i think i think they're great I, i'm hoping i haven't seen all the details of some of the new things they announced um at the beginning of January, but hopefully when those details come out, they're going to really support um, some of the nature-friendly things we're doing on farm. And Phil, do you have anything to add to that from a kind of policy um, standpoint on how you see them supporting farmers um, and their climate um, adaptations? Yeah, so I suppose everything that most of the people speaking today have done is more or less or can be supported through through schemes so even like the real basic stuff like soil testing and nutrient management plan and all of those sorts of things which can yeah inform what you do to increase soil organic matter or soil health reduce fertilizer use effectively all that sort of stuff to then moving far beyond that to some of the stuff that sam was doing in terms of wood pasture creation and all of that so it's it's all all good but i think one of the key points is yeah as particularly for that more ambitious stuff, providing enough access for people who want to go and, and and are able to do that sort of stuff is really key. And then one final one from me before we move on to audience questions was, um, aside from the benefits to carbon and biodiversity, were there any kind of unexpected benefits that you've seen from actually modifying what you're doing on farm as a result of either carbon audits or just um, trying to adapt to a changing climate? David? Oh, D Debbie made the point earlier, actually, it's just, um, it's a lot more of a positive experience. Um, and I mean, you've only got to compare the difference. If you go to a show like Groundswell, where everyone's really positive and, you know, finding solutions, and then you go to something like Cereals, where it's, you know, it can be a lot more negative. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that sort of uh, positive experience that comes from doing these things is hugely underrated. Sam, anything to add to that, or do you, you agree? Yeah, completely agree. I mean, it's just, um, you know, it's much more positive feeling around the farm now. Um, you know, uh, it's just really exciting, you know, you change your mindset about what about what you're doing, and then everything sort of, yeah, everything gets better, really. And it's, it's better for our family um, as well. Um, so, yeah. Debbie, anything to add to that, or would you agree with her? all of the above i think i agree with what they're saying yeah like i'm saying it yes nice nicer environment to be in and also meeting like-minded people you know it's really nice to be with similar people who think similarly to you so that's quite for me i think that's what i've enjoyed about changing things is connecting with other people who feel similarly to me and that, that kind of um, networking has been really good that's really good to know um, so we'll move on to some audience questions now. Looking like the most popular question was actually um, one for you, Phil, from your presentation, which was, was there any relationship between the proportion of each farm occupied by land of high nature value and their carbon footprint when you were doing that project? Yes, in general, those farms which had a higher proportion of the so-called kind of high nature value habitats didn't perform very well on the kilogram per unit of output measure and generally did better on um, like carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions per hectare. Um, so those systems were generally more extensive and so-called less efficient. Um, but there's lots of things in there. And I think this is one of the things that like some, a lot of the conversation around this has been around sequestration and, and and drawing carbon in some of the things that have been in the chat and one of the that isn't really acknowledged is um kind of carbon that you're already storing so if you've got well managed kind of permanent grasslands there's carbon that's been stored in there for a long period of time and bill in the chat mentioned around the perverse consequences of kind of focusing on herbal lays and reseeds whenever you've got permanent pasture and that release releases carbon all sorts of things so the carbon calculators aren't nuanced enough to kind of figure a lot of that out um 
so yes there were trends but there was a lot of stuff that was was probably missed within it as well i would say and um have the farmers since the project finished so if they um change any of their practices as a result of the kind of biodiversity and um carbon audit results um what outcomes have they taken forward yes there's been some that have um yeah done done relatively small things after as a result this study took place just before the rollout of another scheme which is government supported which is supporting kind of baseline soil testing and things like that which again is going to contribute towards um i suppose on farm decision making as well so we'll see where where that goes but yeah there was some uptake of things but i think it was the fact that there was a report there were some recommendations and then there was maybe a bit of um kind of enthusiasm after that, but you really need, I think it really, yeah, you kind of need that long-term kind of continuation and the knowledge exchange afterwards that that both David and Sam were talking about as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, we've got one for, I guess, David and Debbie, because I think you both mentioned a little bit on um crop residues. So um somebody's asked are crop residues much of a disease risk despite their other positives so do you see any kind of negatives from leaving kind of cover on your land to kind of hold in moisture and anything like that so in terms of our crop rotation we don't actually i mean that the only thing that that might throw up is if you are going to follow um wheat with wheat and we don't we used to we used to grow second wheats um but we don't now so um, we grow a spring cereal instead. So there isn't that kind of disease issue, um, you know, potential issue from from the residue. Um, but the other thing is that the soils are a lot, that the biology in the soil is a lot more active. Um, and there's a huge amount we don't know about what goes on in the soils. But sort of anecdotally, we're seeing that um, by having that, that sort of biologically active soil, it actually performs a huge amount of um, sort of, a, a, a agronometric husbandry for us um in terms of you know the beneficial insects you know we've got carapid beetles that are controlling slugs um we've got fungi which are you know breaking up stuff for us which otherwise would have used a cultivator for with that there's an awful lot of things going on which you know we, we've we, we actually see a lot of our black grass seeds get predated now so by leaving them on the surface they're getting they're getting eaten um or they just or they just perish and die so um yeah there's there's a lot more benefit to it than um the negative that's great to know um and i think we had a question as well a little bit on um putting in drainage and whether you see any extra soil loss from that but i think from what you said about um the biological activity in the soil i'm assuming you're going to say that that's that's also yeah, helped with any so... kind of soil loss <laughs> i mean drain Drain, if we if we didn't put drainage in, the soil loss would be huge because it would all just run off. Um, you know, it, it's that that sort of engineered system. And, and unless you're, I, I think there'd be, uh, unless you're going to have some sort of uh, perennial crop or um, or, or a forest, uh, you know, if you are actually trying to farm the land and put annual crops on it, then you need you need drainage for sure. Yeah. No, <laughs> very good points. Um, speaking of drainage and um, flooding, Debbie, I was wondering if you could, because um, what we know uh, as a network, you've been in the press quite a lot recently about the types of flood management you're doing. So I just wondered if you could give um, the audience a bit of extra information on your kind of floodplain management and, and kind of the impacts that that's had on your farm and how you're managing that. Uh, yeah, I did. basically we can't really stop the water coming because there's a lot of water that comes. Um, so it's just managing the fields so they're resilient to that flooding. And, you know, we can't have um, arable crops really there or even kind of um, kind of ryegrass and things like that because they'll be killed by the flood. So that's where we go for the permanent pasture and the species rich meadows that can cope with being flooded um, and can come back. So they're kind of lower um, productivity from them overall, but they can cope and so you don't have to, you know, re-sow or um, if you're doing spring crops, you know, leaving, you know, 
the kind of neighbours who you know have maize in fields that get flooded and they leave it bare over winter and when it gets flooded I feel you know how much soil and things it's taking away so it's the idea of and actually if you look at my fields that were flooded um now the water's gone down they're all brown they were green before they got flooded and they're not brown because the grass has died they're brown because I've been catching all the silt that's been in that water so fields upstream that have lost soil I've now got a bit of it a lot of it will have gone down the river and out but you know I've got some of it um and so yeah it's, it's more of just being that resilient to coping with with the floods and being able to bounce back um it does mean I can't really outwinter cattle or anything down there because um, they'd have to learn to swim. But um, it yeah. does mean that I can carry on farming them. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really good to hear kind of how you're managing that. Um, Sam, we've got quite a few questions for you as well. Um, and looking at that, we've got some on, have you been monitoring the water quality and biodiversity as well with the change uh, yeah, of fertiliser so and land? You just sat typing an answer I was just that typing. One. I was <laughs> typing away there. And yeah, no, I saw that one. Um, so yes, sun. So we did we did a baseline biodiversity survey, um, which was quite high level because we couldn't really afford anything more than that. Um, so we got the Cumbria Biodiversity Data Centre to come with a team of sort of fifteen ecologists, uh, but it was just one day. So you know, and they were just here. On, it was like the fourth of August, two thousand nineteen. So it's like you know, it's just a, a snapshot really of what the of what what it was like. Um, we'd love to do more of that type of thing. Um, and then in, on water quality, we haven't we haven't really had the the sort of funding or the time to sort of um, to do that. But uh, we'd absolutely love to do that. And actually, ha we had the environment agency here yesterday on a uh, on a sort of um, farm visit. So I was trying to I'm trying to get them to to help with that. David or Debbie, have you had um, any water quality type work done on your farms or noticed that from any of the work you've been doing? So I had a, um, have... sorry, oh, sorry. Go, on. go on, David. <laughs> so uh, I, I was um, on the steering group for the HDB strategic farm, which was um, at Patrick and Brian Barker's farm in Suffolk. And one of the trials they did there was um, to monitor the drainage outflows from a field uh, and some of the field was ploughed and some of the field had a cover crop in. Over the winter, they measured all the, the, the outfalls and, and what was coming out with the comparing the two different systems. And the um, the one with the cover crop in, the water that was coming out was actually cleaner than drinking water. It was like pristine. Um, whereas the ploughed one, they were losing nitrate um, out of the drains. So we haven't actually done any sort of uh, tests from our own outfalls here, but um, there's there's quite a lot of evidence showing the, the benefits in, in terms of uh, sort of nu nutrient loss. And obviously that, that nitrate we need for growing crops. Debbie? Um, I don't think we've done anything on kind of actual kind of streams and kind of outfalls from drains or anything like that. Um, but we have had some stuff with um, WWT doing some pond monitoring and stuff and seeing what the, you know, what the water quality in the ponds were. Um, and that, that was pretty, pretty good, but I haven't got historic to things, see how things have changed. So um, yeah, I haven't kind of got a, uh, a kind of set of information to see what what's improved as we've done things but i think the problem with the farm is we things have changed very slowly over time so it's not like picked a day and we decided to change everything it's some of things have historically been like that forever and slowly other things have been introduced so um, yeah it's hard to know what the, what things have changed what that can i be really cheeky and ask a question yeah go for it phil there's there's a question in the chat to Sam about profitability from um, yeah, removing kind of grain-based feed and reducing fertilizer and stuff. And Debbie, when you were talking, you mentioned about the recommendation to reduce um, first age of calving. And you said about having to move to like animals indoors earlier, potentially, and things like that. Do you think in certain circumstances, 
if you were to follow the carbon advice, it could be more costly to your system? I think it's going to be dependent on a lot of things. So um, what facilities you've got. So if you've already got a shed there that animals could come into, as opposed to if you haven't got that facility, um, what what land you've got available to graze. So whether you've, you know, if you have to rent in land or if you've already. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of variables, but I personally feel that um, it could add cost to the system if you're driven to the more intensification, which is okay if you've got enough, you know, um, you know, if you've got enough output, you know, the, the cost, you know, what your inputs and outputs go the right way and you've got enough, if you've got a high milk price or whatever, then that will support that. Whereas if, you know, prices are dropping and then you've, you know, you haven't got the, the money to support that high input cost. So, sorry, not very, not very good answer, but I think it depends on a lot of things. But I think you can, I think for me, it is a lower, um, you can do things in a lower um, cost way by having, say, stock outside. Um, and you might have a lower growth rates and things, but I think it balances out that it is more profitable to to do things slowly. But when you're looking at um, methane emissions from ruminants, that's you know it, it's that's very much the lifetime of the animal, and every animal is assumed to produce so much methane. Um, I don't know that much about it, but I think that my feeling is that. Um, if they're out grazing and I've heard of, but I don't know much about kind of methogenic bacteria that live in the soil that will kind of eat the methane if they're out grazing. Whereas if they're in a concrete yard, then you haven't got any hope for that methane's going to, and also what they're eating is going to affect it. So there's so many variables that, um, yeah, I'm sure somebody will do a study on it at some point and tell us what we should be doing, but I'll probably carry on doing it the way I want to do it. Yeah, that was a really good answer, I think, because it is a very complex issue as well. Um, we will take um, a note of all of the Q&As that have been in the question box, as well as the answers that Sam might have typed to some of the questions there as well, so that we can make those available for people after the webinar. Um, but I'm afraid due to time, I think we're already running one minute over, so we'll um, wrap up the webinar here. I just want to say a really big thank you to all of our um, speakers, um, some really, really interesting presentations. And it's amazing to see the kind of different strategies you're all using to kind of improve the resilience of your farms in, in different ways and some very similar ways. And just also, it's really um heartwarming to hear that actually changing to this type of systems has kind of positively improved how you feel about farming and, and being on your farm and you've made some really good connections that way so I think it's it's been a really positive webinar and I hope everyone else has enjoyed it as well so um yeah if you want to watch this again at a later date to, to take more more in um, it will be available on our YouTube and our website but thank you very much everyone for joining and and again um, keep checking our website and our newsletters for um, the next webinars that will be coming up thank you very much everyone <laughs>